We're live now. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club. Welcome to Tuesday. And welcome to today's guest, Dr. Brian Fisher, our curator of entomology. Hey, Brian. Hello. Nice to be here. <laughs> we were chatting backstage in case that um, beginning startled anyone else. Um, OK, so Brian, I have been knocking on your email door for a long time because I really want to do on the show. Um, and part of that is because what they say about you is true. You're an excellent storyteller. But also, um, you know, I love science and I will defend the necessity of pure research until the day I die. But what has always struck me most as a human, not surprisingly, is when scientists team up with other people, including non-scientists, to really make something new in the world. Um, and that can be, you know, starting programs with schools or creating field stations or, or making these companies or organizations that go out and do real and surprising work in the world. And I think, I think you've done all of those things, but what you're here to talk to us about today is really one of the most inspiring examples of that latter piece that I've come across. So we're excited to have you here. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the project you're gonna to talk to us about today is actually not what you're most famous for. So you are, you're the Ant-Man because you have discovered an insanely like ridiculously high number of new species of ants in the world. And do you know how many that is now? No, but we're busy describing about a thousand new species from Madagascar. Oh, that's amazing. And do you, any ballpark, just so, just so people understand like the sheer volume we're talking here, any ballpark on previous species descriptions to date? Well, we've discovered about, or described about 500 new species. When I mm -hmm. say we, it's my lab and my team, my colleagues from Madagascar. But, you know, for insects, surprising, um, we know very little about insects. Even mm -hmm. ants, which are everywhere. And I'll mention that a little bit in my story today. Okay. And are ants, were they your gateway insect? Were they what drew you into science in the first place career-wise? Um, I've always wanted to be a scientist, but ants was something that just shocked me when I went to the tropics. As a young undergrad at the University of Iowa, I had the chance to spend almost a year in Panama in the tropics and wanted to be a botanist. Um, hmm studied plants, went down to look at plants, the ecology of plants, the biodiversity of plants, and everywhere I went, there were ants. And <laughs> I started asking, who's looking at these ants? They're everywhere. Um, and everybody said, nobody, really. Um, we can't identify them, there's no field guides. And I said, these, these are more important than birds, more important for, than plants, we have to study them. And I slowly began switching from plants to ants. It's not that difficult. It's just a P and an L and you got ants and I, I was off and running. <laughs> literally all it takes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. That's, an, I'm glad I asked. That's really cool. Um, I will let you get into it. Uh, but I want to remind people first, if you're watching, you can ask Brian questions anytime just by leaving him in the comment section on Facebook or the chat box on YouTube. And we'll loop back at the end and ask him as many as we possibly can. Brian, thank you so much again for being here and we'll uh, see you at the end. With that, I will hand it over for Edible Insects, Where Land Conservation and Protein Meet. Thanks. Thanks, Laurel, and welcome, everybody. Um, this is called The Breakfast Club, so I thought I would start with breakfast. It's one of the few things that hasn't changed in my life um, with our closure of the museum and the COVID is issue, and um, I just wanted to share with you what I have for breakfast. And um, I start every day with some yogurt, but, I also add a spoonful of this. This is actually cricket powder that we produce in Madagascar. And I actually add it to the yogurt, mix it around, and it actually is like satchatella, and it almost has a chocolatey flavor. You see that? And it's actually super nutritious. In fact, just that one scoop, about 25 grams, is enough for a daily allowance of protein and other super duper micronutrients. Mm. But you're not here to watch me eat breakfast. I'll do that on my own later. I'd like to begin my story about where I began and my work in Madagascar. It's a story that highlights this incredible connection, historical connection we have to insects but also brings the important realization that we are having an impact on the environment, that we are losing important landscapes. And as a result, human society is at, at risk of enjoying life and, and, and building into our hopeful future. And I think insects, edible insects, offer a solution, a solution that 
can be scaled from villages to whole large scale um, urban areas. It's a solution that is super sustainable. It's the most efficient way to convert energy into protein, provides micronutrients. It's a solution that can work for Madagascar. It's a solution that can work for all of Africa. And it's something that we should consider in our, in our lives. So I am Brian Fisher, the ant man, but also now the cricket, butterfly, bacon bug, um, insect person from Madagascar. And I'm gonna begin the slideshow, I hope. Um, it will begin. And as I said, I begin with the world of looking at the world through the eye of the ants. Now, I love ants, everybody should love ants. And people don't realize ants represent really the bulk of biodiversity. They represent the insects in a sense. Now the insects are there, invisible to most of us, but you can't talk about conservation. You can't talk about a rainforest. You can't talk about landscapes without understanding that forests make no sense in light of, of insects. And we've heard about this potential apocalypse of insects, but we really don't even understand if that's true or not. We don't even understand what's happening to the environments because we really haven't invested in monitoring. For the same reason we haven't invested in monitoring for health like viruses, we haven't invested in understanding the world around us, and we should. And maybe coming out of this um, closure of society, we'll come out with a new understanding of the importance of these kind of long-term investments like basic science, investing in monitoring. And I hope that also helps the world of insects. Whoops. Now, when people think of Madagascar, you may immediately think of that vacation uh, that you dreamed of to go to this island with incredible biodiversity. Lemurs, for example, there's about 120 species of lemurs in Madagascar. They're all endemic to the island. They're only found there. In fact, as a biologist, that's one of the reasons I went to Madagascar was to find out what's only found there. It's a special place because of its geological isolation. It broke away from Africa about 120 million years ago, along with India, then India went north, hitting Asia, creating the Himalayas. Meanwhile, Madagascar for 80 million years has been sitting there like its own world, its own continent. And as such, everything is beautiful. However, even as a biologist, it's taken me a while to realize that that incredible tourist destination has another side. That other side is that a huge, massive deforestation has happened across the island. Uh, there's really only about 10% of the native lands left across the island. It includes a lot of forests, but also other landscapes. And the people on, on the island, about 92% um, live on less than $2 a day. 53% of the children are malnourished. And there are very few options left. They can't put more cattle on already degraded landscapes. You can't actually cut down more forests because soon there's gonna be no forest left. Slash and burn agriculture is a technique of just kind of temporarily being able to use the land. It's temporary because sometimes you can only get one or two years of crop before you have to go and cut more land. Those are no longer sustainable options. Now, what brought me to Madagascar was the forest. Think of that small patches of forest that have survived in Madagascar. And I wanted to go there to figure out what insects, in particular ants, are found there. Now, it's been the greatest adventure over the last 25 years is figuring out how to get to the forest. We spend more time going to forest than we do actually in the forest itself. Now, this has been really some of the most incredible stories of, of adventure and four by four vehicle recovery. Here we are trying to get our vehicle back um, in time for the holidays around in December. But it's also been, um, as a scientist, some of the most thrilling moments of my life to actually go into these canyons and then be the first one to uncover this new genus for Madagascar, like, um, the, the dracal ants, for example, a new species of dracal ant that's only found in Madagascar. The beauty, the adventure, at the same time, it takes a lot of teamwork to get to these places. And that forces you, in a sense, to start working with the local people and realizing what a wonderful, 
culture and diversity that you can find in Madagascar. Now, you begin to ask yourself, what advantage does all this biological exploration have for Madagascar? And one of it is, is that if we can use these surveys to actually understand biodiversity, we can actually help kind of coordinate the, the protection of these existing forests that are left in Madagascar. And one goal is to create and use this data for like a live Dow Jones index to the environment. If we can understand how we're impacting it, we may be able to make better decisions about where we put a mine, a road, and can we also ask questions about, are we actually doing a good job of conserving these forests? Can we, how much use can we allow in the forest without having a tipping point for the loss of biodiversity? And through this, our, our work there of inventorying ants has slowly migrated toward trying to understand the biodiversity of the whole forest. And working with colleagues, uh, mostly in Sweden and, and Scandinavia, we've launched a program to actually in almost real time monitor forests. We're working in 54 sites across Madagascar where we have these traps, like this malaise trap, where we actually sample uh, insects uh, in, a, in a live, uh, through using like genomics to look at the species, how they change across weeks, across sites. It's a fabulous study and it's really the future of, I think, biological inventories around the world. But let's get back to the field. Now, imagine you're the first person to actually get to uh, a forest like this. Here we are in this beautiful lowland forest. Nobody's been there. And you go out into the forest and you just are surprised what you see. Now, you have to be ready for surprises. And this ant here in this kind of clay ear um, was a very bizarre ant to find on these cliff banks. It's a new genus for Madagascar. And we didn't understand why these ants make this hollow cavity where the ants just build their nest. All the larvae are just tucked in there. How could that be protected? Well, we term this ant the hero ant. There's these ants that hang out on the lip of this ear. And when a predator comes to come and steal and eat the babies, these hero ants grab them and jump off the cliff with the predator. This is why we named them the hero ant. A wonderful ant. Another ant also shown here is the trap jaw ant. This beautiful ant that has a high speed snap of a mandible, walks around looking for, like a, like a jaguar, looking for anything to snap and take down in this like little miniature world of the leaf litter. But to explore biodiversity, you need a team. And to do this just for ants and to not even think about including all people, we had to create really a start of entomology in Madagascar by training students. And we needed a place to do that. So we created this Madagascar Biodiversity Center and we began training students to help us with this inventory work and actually promote the monitoring and study of insects on the island. And here's our team and our building. And I must mention that the building was actually funded by really the, the generosity of the Bay Area through private donors. And it's been a great and important service for the development of future scientists in Madagascar. Because without creating that local knowledge, all we're doing is just academic. We actually have to invest in the long-term future of having this science done by people in Madagascar. But as we traveled across Madagascar, I began to ask myself, have I actually helped preserve any forest? We are monitoring forest. We're understanding what's in the forest. We figured out where a really cool forest is. But often I've gone back to those really cool forests three years later, later and the forest is gone. And I begin to wonder how many forests will be left in Madagascar in 50 years? Um, is this the future where we have only the baobabs that are left because they're sacred trees and the rest of the forest is just cut down? This is a problem also because of population growth, a world phenomenon where we have increasing population and fewer and fewer resources. While I've worked in Madagascar, the population has almost doubled. And if it doubles again, there's still no way we can feed these people without losing all the forest in Madagascar. 
there is a link between malnutrition in Madagascar and the environment. And we have to figure out how we can make those work together. I've spent my entire life trying to find and work only in that forest. But I have to find a way, I thought, to work outside that forest. If I don't, there's no way we're going to be able to protect the, the remaining forest. And this is what launched this idea of breakfast before conservation. We can't go outside the forest and say, don't cut down the forest unless we can also provide or give an alternative to the food, to the access to the protein that they're harvesting from the forest, either through cutting down the forest or killing lemurs. And I wondered what I could do, but then it just hit me. It's the edible insects of Madagascar. Now, edible insects have um, maybe an ick factor, but actually in Madagascar, there's a long tradition of eating insects. And there's a lot of good reasons to eat insects. Environmental reasons. They have a very small footprint. Yes, they have very small feet, but there's a huge benefit from farming insects to eat over cows, over pigs, over chickens. It's because they're cold-blooded animals. They don't have to waste energy on producing heat, which also requires them to produce sweat. So there's, they're more efficient in terms of conversion, of giving food to a cricket, for example, and having that convert into protein. It's much more efficient, six times more efficient than a cow, for example. It takes a lot less water because you don't have to waste that water on sweat. You can just turn it into a living producer of protein. And we're also learning it's not just this great source of protein. It's a great source of micronutrients that are actually more easily absorbed. Our bodies can absorb those micronutrients better if we eat it through food from an edible insect rather than through a cow, for example. And it also improves our gut microbiome, which may explain why children really benefit from this when they're already um, sick. Studies are just now really exploring these areas over protein, like micronutrient uptake, like iron uptake, that you can get more iron from eating edible insects than if you ate a steak, for example. But overall, for us to actually explore this, we took various approaches. We decided that we would actually first conduct an inventory across Madagascar to learn about all the edible insects that are eaten on the island. And at the same time, we wanted to explore the literature to see if these traditions have changed over time. And if there's anything we can actually rekindle in terms of this tradition of eating edible insects. What we found to get right to the point is that the edible insect tradition is still live, it's still widespread, and it's still being really driven by the fact that they're tasty to eat. Nobody said I'm eating this because it's a good for the environment. They're eating it because it tastes good and they're eating it because it's available. Now, I wanted to begin this little review of the history of eating edible insects by starting off with the first record I found of edible insects. It's from a early travels by Flaucourt, who stayed three years in, in, in Madagascar in 1658. He recorded that he had discovered this mana in the south of Madagascar. This mana was a sugary exudate from a butterfly and the locals gathered it up and it's like a, a, a chunk of sugar that they could eat and they, it was delicious. Now this is not a butterfly. It's actually like a cicada, a full gourd, uh, easily confused with, confused with the butterfly maybe because um, once you approach it, they all kind of flutter away with these red wings. But actually, it's just what we call a flatted. It's a beautiful thing. And it actually occurs over and over again through the literature about going in and people eating this sugary substance. It became so popular that actually in about 1910, a French botanist started to actually farm this 
to see if he could actually produce enough to sell for human consumption. As it turned out, this plantations that they put out did not produce enough for uh, human consumption in terms of economics of it. But it was interesting that it was thought of as, as a very interesting um, cash crop of producing this sugary substance in Madagascar for export in, in, uh, from Madagascar as part of this kind of colonial uh, trade. But by far, the, one of the most important in terms of historical traditions in Madagascar is the eating of silk moth larva. The silk industry uh, globally um, it was a huge factor in international trade uh, around the world. And explorers and, and visitors to islands always were looking for some angle to actually capitalize on the huge economic gains one could get from actually creating the better silk. And when they came to Madagascar, everybody noted that there were about four different types of, of silk being used locally. There was a very extensive and developed um, textile industry in Madagascar using silk, wild silk, mainly from about four different uh, groups of moths. One of them shown here is from the, the high plateau or the central highlands of Madagascar. And it's semi-domesticated and there was a lot of effort to improve the silk on this. Now, why I think this became so popular was because it didn't really have much of an ick factor. Um, the French cuisine, I think, really was amenable to having this integrated. Um, early explorers noted it was more like curdled milk once you remove the uh, pupa and start cooking with it. Others, on the top there, you'll see um, uh, uh, veal brains, um, and that is what was mostly referred to as the taste of eating this larva. And in fact, in 1884, official dinners at the residence of the French government in the capital in Madagascar served silk moth pupa with Bay Michel sauce, a white cream sauce on the dinners. In other words, in about, you know, in the 1900s, it was it's quite popular to be seen and integrating and being part of this tradition in Madagascar uh, of eating silkworms. It's, it's a really interesting area of study in Madagascar to go and look at that tech, the interface between this, uh, the silkworms and the textile industry and the human consumption. Um, others were quite impressed with this kind of zero waste model because this, for the silk moth, once you remove the cocoon for making silk fabric, you get to eat the pupa. So they were linked. So nothing went to waste. It's one of the first zero waste models for uh, uh, kind of sustainable clothing making. Now, even today in the capital, in fact, right next to our center in a very large market, you can see uh, silk moth pupa shown here um, being sold uh, next to shrimp. Um, for about the same price as shrimp. So even today, it's still being used. And I must note that they phylogenetically classified this pretty well, that the shrimp, a, a crustacean, along with insects, were grouped together. I thought that was really good. Um, but this, my point is that even today, these traditions live on, um, even though the silk industry is not as developed anymore um, because of the, uh, people don't use uh, a wild, sick, um, wild or domesticated silk as much anymore. But I also want to mention this other thing, eating spiders. Um, Madagascar, there's this huge spider there, golden orb weaver, and it's giant and everywhere uh, it's found, people eat it. There's about seven different species. They're all eaten. In fact, it's often the young boys that are out watching the cattle herds that will snack on them all day long. You just grab the four legs so they can't, uh, you know, pierce you with their venom. And then you can put them in the coals and then just pop them in your mouth. So people say they're, they're very sweet. Now, this also got the interest of the early visitors um, because of the silk industry. The silk industry was like, if we can find a better silk, we're going to make it rich. So everybody's always looking. And they looked at this beautiful, fine, strong silk of this nephila, now called, now called trichonephila in Madagascar. And 
it became very interesting. For over about 100 years, people began testing and developing. And finally, this Spanish Jesuit priest in Italy, um, Tremor, developed this contraption um, in northern Italy for actually silking uh, spiders. And this technology then was brought to Madagascar. And people began actually thinking about and, and learning. Um, and there was actually a technical school developed um, where they actually had women, shown here in white, gardening a collection of spiders out in the field. They would take the spiders, bring them in, silk them, and then once all the silk was taken, bring them back to the field, and let them recover and recuperate while they actually then could keep kind of a sustainable use of, of silk that, of, of spiders that way. Um, one could imagine maybe one could also do that for farming purposes, uh, for eating. But as it turned out, they produced some beautiful silk that it was on the um, Paris Exposé in 1900. But since then, it just disappeared. Until on the right, we had this person, um, a wonderful guy. I just had um, uh, dinner with him a, a few weeks ago in Madagascar, um, Simon Piers. He learned about this tradition almost 100 years ago and decided because of his love for textiles and silk to make something. So he himself, not even as a biologist, he actually had a team to go outside in the city of the capital, pick up spiders, bring them inside, silk them using a specialized adaptation of that silk spinner and make this beautiful, uh, beautiful yellow kind of dress shown here. Now this, Silk dress is now in a museum in Europe, and it's unfortunate they're not making more of this because it's such a dazzling and representative beauty of uh, a natural product. Now, could you imagine yourself wearing this? Who would who would actually want to get one of these? Well, I, when I saw this, I thought I thought immediately of oh, Beyonce. This is her thing. So Beyonce, if you're listening, um, think about a silk dress. Uh, soon from Madagascar. It's a possibility. Talk to Simon Piers. He'll set you up. Now, back to our inventory of edible insects. Sorry for that aside on spiders, but I just find it so fascinating. But in the end, we're not farming spiders in Madagascar. It's really not a good idea, I think, to um, farm a predator like a spider, or we should actually think about some other more sustainable, maybe a silk moth that we could harvest. But we wanted to explore all the possibilities, and that meant inventorying more and more insects that could serve in our new edible insect farm. And we began serving across the island, and we consistently found that it's usually the young kids that are out collecting like aquatic insects. They're eating a lot of interesting aquatic insects, including dragonfly larva, beetle larva, and they're catching this along with the little small fish. And that's what's serving as an important protein source in their in their diet. This is just a picture of some of the 160 different species we've collected so far of uh, insects that are being eaten in Madagascar. We actually have to revisit basically all the forests of Madagascar again, around the forests, the villages. We have a team that surveys and, and, and looks at perceptions and understands what they're eating. And there's a challenge, of course, of how to identify a plate of grubs that are being eaten. So we're, we've turned to genetic barcoding where we're actually sequencing them all and linking them to specimens that we've identified from adults. Just as an aside, uh, once you start men mentioning you are interested in insects, immediately they start talking about bees. Um, and this is somebody here shown a bee colony asking if we wanted to buy it. And I have never been offered a bee colony before, but one could because honey is just a wonderful thing in Madagascar and the people love it and they can't stop talking about it. If you bring people to the field and they see bees going by, all they want to do is follow it and get the honey. But um, that's kind of another subject, but I want to talk more about the edible insects that we could find that actually could be farmed. And everywhere we went, we saw people eating beetles. And it's often collected by the kids shown here. This is just an example of one preparation where they, this is a, a rhinoceros beetle that the, the wings are pulled off and 
almost like all the beetles, are, they're with a little bit of oil, or in this case, no oil because they're fatty enough. Um, they're, they're just grilled and then eaten. And they're actually delicious once they're cooked. Um, but they're often viewed as a tasty treat because it takes a while to find them. They're only available in that brief moment of abundance. So it'd be interesting to see if we could figure out how to farm them, but we wanted to keep looking for other insects. And there was one insect that kept coming to our attention over and over again, and that was the locust. The locust seemed to be a really important part of the diets of many people in Madagascar. Now, when you think about a swarm of locust, it's very different when you talk about a South Sea island filled with penguins or a wildebeest migration that inspires awe and beauty in nature. When you talk about a swarm of locusts in Madagascar, even the BBC thinks of it as a horrible thing. But in Madagascar, um, it's both horrible in the sense that it eats your crops, but it also provides an incredible amount of protein if you're lucky enough to be able to gather them up. And we found over and over again, the locust and, and, and grasshoppers in Madagascar, like this giant grasshopper that people sell in the markets in the north of Madagascar, um, is really important part of the diet uh, in Madagascar. Now, here we're showing how people, when there's not a migratory swarm, you can actually go out and find them. And they actually collect them with uh, uh, like a, a plastic bottle, they come back, they take off their legs, and they they just fry them up. They, they kind of look like little shrimp. They almost taste like shrimp. And it's really important part of the diet. It's hard to really understand how important they are because they're eaten so by the kids almost every day, but nobody records that. And by the adults, they're only eaten when they're abundant enough. But Looking through the historical records, we've found that actually it's really an important and early kind of invention for sustaining times where you have no other food to eat. They would actually take the locust, according to the old literature, take their legs off, boil them, dry them in the sun, and then pound them into a powder and keep that powder and add it to their food or just even a soup of it for the rest of the year when they have no other products like rice or corn to eat. We have found exactly those same recipes repeated by people now in Madagascar. So that tradition that we can record in the literature 200, 300 years ago is still present here today and is eaten today whole, but often even as a, as a powder. The other exciting insect that we kept uncovering across Madagascar is what we call now the bacon bug. It's uh, like a cicada. It has a piercing, sucking mouth part that drinks sugar from plants. And it's just a bizarre insect. It's uh, If you take off its fuzz, it looks like this. It's got this incredible snout. Um, but you can kind of get a sense it's kind of fatty. Um, in fact, that's what makes it such a yummy. You can cook it without adding any grease or fat. It just cooks in its own fat. It tastes like bacon. And that's why we call it the bacon bug. Personally, it's my favorite edible insect. And I know you would like it too, if we could figure out how to mass scale farm it. So here it is just being cooked in a, in a skillet and served uh, here in our, in, uh, for us uh, as a special treat, um, as a snack. But imagine if we could farm this and provide bacon for everybody in Madagascar. In fact, there is an attempt to try to farm that and that work is being led by Courtney Borgeson from Montclair State University. We're working together to see if we can replace bush meat, which is often lemurs, around Mashual National Park in the northeast of Madagascar with the bacon bug. In fact, we were there in March for a week with her to better understand how we can actually augment uh, the success rate of farming this. But unfortunately, we had two things happen. We had a cyclone that rained more than a meter of rain in about five days. 
And then we had Madagascar shutting down. In fact, we barely made it out to get the last flight out of Madagascar to come back on March uh, 19th, um, back to the United States. But that bacon bug, you'll be hearing more about it in the future. Now, why is this interesting? Now in the villages, these villages around the forest really have no access to protein unless they go into the forest or they fish. Now fishing is becoming more difficult uh, because of they've sold off in the rights of fishing to larger companies in a sense and the locals are suffering. And with increasing population, there's fewer and fewer fish. And there, Sukundru is already shown here on the, on the leaf, already part of their diets. And what we wanted to do with Courtney as the lead is to figure out how we can augment farming them and make them more available and see if they could actually reduce uh, bushmeat consumption. This is just an example of the equipment used for fishing. It's low tech. And we wanted to make the bacon bug farming as low tech and as simple and as scalable as, as other activities that they do in, in these villages. And she's got a team of uh, assistants shown here as one of them that are actually testing different cultivation techniques and feeding techniques and cooking techniques for the use of the bacon bug um, in these villages. And I think it's gonna be an important success story for reducing bushmeat uh, and protecting the lemurs in Madagascar. Here she is working there. Now, for the most of Madagascar though, um, it's too dry and there's already an acute lack of nutrients and already areas with almost famine in Madagascar. We wanted to find an insect that we could actually farm to actually augment the nutrition of these villages, to reduce the pressure for them to migrate into areas to cut down the forest, to actually improve the nutrition of kids so they can learn better at school and actually have a hope uh, and create hope in these villages. And to do that, I teamed up with Darren from Entomo Farms. He's the cricket guy that's been farming. He's, he's farming, the uh, has a, the largest commercial production of, of cricket powder in North America with his two brothers. And he's volunteered their company to help us figure out how to farm a native species in Madagascar so that we can actually produce at large quantity um, cricket powder to help reduce and address acute uh, malnutrition across the island. We also brought into this team, um, Sylvain, shown here, who's actually a, a world expert on Orthoptera from Madagascar and mating behavior of crickets. And he was the one that helped us inventory Madagascar and find native species that we could potentially farm in each region of the island. In the central highlands around the capital, we've already found one species that we're actually are now farming and testing and retesting and refining how we farm and figure out what to eat, what temperature we should incubate the eggs at, and develop it. And now we have a kind of a model for commercial scale production where we have a processing that we can produce on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, cricket powder. But also you may not realize we produce an equal amount of fertilizer. Cricket poop is an excellent fertilizer. And this is why this system is so wonderful for Madagascar. You can grow crickets, produce cricket powder, to feed you locally, your family, or to sell for famine relief, or to use the fertilizer to improve reforestation efforts, or to actually improve your own vegetable garden. It's a beautiful model that's actually shown over and over again at different scales is really effective uh, in Madagascar. Um, to take advantage of this, we kind of created our, our, our test farm called Valala Farm, and that is the farm that's producing cricket powder in Madagascar. And, and it's a product that's being used by famine relief international organizations like um, Catholic Relief Services, um, UNICEF. 
Um, and also we've had it certified as a sustainable product through the Intel Trust Global Insect Food Certification Program. And right now we have what you would call a test facility that we're actually uh, are producing about 30 kilos of cricket powder per month through a wonderful staff that's really the innovators behind all the techniques we're using to sustainably grow these uh, crickets, this native species. And just to give an idea, this is a harvest. And unlike a cow, which you kill at its prime of its life or a chicken, we actually harvest these grass, these crickets at the end of their life, after they've laid eggs. And then we anesthetize them with CO2. We dry them, grind them into a powder. And that powder, here it is being ground, dried, and produced into a powder, which is what I showed you earlier when I had breakfast. It's a powder that's stable. You can ship it all over Madagascar. It can stay in a hut for two years and still be good. Very different than a steak, for example. Now, what is, I think, unique about this innovation is that we're not producing this just to be a novel snack. It's being produced to actually change the equation in Madagascar. It's a solution, one of the few solutions that we can scale up now that can actually address food insecurity across the country. Without food security, you can't have the remaining forest stay forest. Without food security, you can't have children going to school and actually learning. They need food to learn. They need a breakfast to learn. And that's why we also now are having our product being used in school lunch programs. We have 10 schools in the, around in the capital that are using uh, recipes that local cooks have helped develop with our product. And this school lunch was with a tuberculosis clinic in the south of Madagascar. It was an interesting test that where we gave half the people the cricket powder in their meals three times a week, and half the people didn't have it. Those who didn't have it, after a while, noticed that those who ate it were getting healthier, were gaining weight, were improving. And then they demanded that they would not accept food unless it had cricket powder. And that was, to me, the, the greatest proof of concept that cricket powder is a healthy alternative. And they also ate it because it tastes good. So where are we now? Well, we figured out how to grow this native species, but we've created and seen an incredible demand for it across the island. Even to feed for famine relief, to feed into this international uh, famine relief effort in Madagascar, we need to upscale our production. In fact, we actually need to become better at uh, growing the cricket and having more farms across Madagascar. And we also have to figure out how to actually create our village scale products that we can actually bring to villages so that they have a unit that they can actually control for their family and produce food just for their family. And that's really the next phase for Madagascar for the cricket growing, but also we're exploring how we can more effectively use the cricket the fertilizer and we've had test gardens that are using it. We have reforestation programs that are actually using the cricket powder um, poop. And it's actually, I think, going to be a really important uh, element or ingredient for this goal of reforesting areas of Madagascar. But to do that, we're gonna to have to create a larger facility. Um, and our goal now is to create kind of the first large in edible insect research center and farm number one near our center in Madagascar. We've already gotten the okay from the Minister of uh, Higher Education, which has basically given us the land to build this center. We've worked with architects in Madagascar to design and uh, create this center. And now we're actually are on the fundraising phase uh, to actually make this realization. But that's just one part of the equation. Our long-term goal is to create these centers across Madagascar or these farms across Madagascar linked to local efforts where we're working in villages and fine-tuning the 
species regrow to the needs and the conditions that are found locally. What we're doing in Madagascar, I think, is a, an important solution for biodiversity, but it's also something that could be applied across Madagascar and Africa. And maybe back here to our home. I mean, why aren't we eating more crickets? We have, in fact, great Bay Area companies like those who say eat bugs um, in the mission who are growing and producing crickets powder in their, in, their, in their products. But maybe it's more hesitant to make this change. But everything's changing now. This is the time to really reinforce this change. We can do it. We don't have to wait for plan B. What is plan B? Going to Mars? You know, we've all seen the Martian. We know what's gonna happen there. We're gonna eat potatoes. We can't live off potatoes. Believe me, the only way we could survive in Mars is if we grew insects. So don't wait to eat insects on Mars. Start right now. Go and buy some product, give it a taste. Start inventing new recipes. Add it to a Bay Michelle sauce. But the most important is to think that it's clear we are capable of changing our habits and insects is a traditional habit that we should re-embrace. And it's really a solution, not just for Madagascar, but really for the whole planet. So thank you for listening and I will gladly accept uh, questions about any of this from ants to edible insects to what you have for breakfast. Brian, thank you so much. Also, I have um, good news for you. I'm 100% sure that Beyonce watches this show. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, we do have questions, so I'll dive right in. Christian asked, besides nutrients, do edible insects provide any other benefits, like healthy bacteria for our digestive systems, for example? Well, the gut mi microbiome is uh, just, just research is just beginning, and it's been shown that it does improve um, the gut microbiome. Now, this may explain why, for example, at the TB clinic where you have children who aren't responding to medication and they're sick and they have diarrhea and they start on eating cricket powder, their diarrhea stops and they start improving. It could be that it's just because the gut microbiome improves in these children. They stop having diarrhea. They can actually then start gaining weight and that's why they're actually responding to the medication. So I think this is why I think um, edible insect powder is going to be really important for addressing um, certain types of malnutrition in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. Is anyone doing the, that work to try to quantify those other, the additional benefits? Or is that something that we just have that will in, unfold as we get a better system of the gut microbiome? Well, there's actually a group in, at, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, who are studying this. Oh, so wow. They okay. just published some papers uh, last year on this, on this topic. Okay, cool. We'll stay tuned. Uh, Nathan asked, of all the edible insects you've had, what's your absolute favorite? Oh, it's the bacon bug um, by okay. far. I think um, you mentioned that, but yeah. Any um, specific preparation? Oh, actually, it's, um, you know, you can just eat it as a snack, right? You just put it in a pan, fry it up, and, and pop it. I'm, I, I love snacks. I can snack all day long. But you can actually do so much more with it. You can actually integrate it into, uh, you know, um, with leafy greens. And there's this really interesting uh, uh, green in, in Madagascar. It's worldwide. It's, a, it's a, I think, an aster. It makes your lips burn. And that's one of my favorite ones. It's called um, bread mafana. And it's a hot bread. It makes your tongue go numb. It's really interesting when you combine it with the bacon bug. So I would highly recommend that. Okay. Good to know. Um, JC asked, I've seen dried crickets for sale online, but is there any way that we can try some of these other insects you mentioned right now? Well, you would have to collect them yourself. Um, and you can, it's, there's no law against it. You can go out mm -hmm. and collect them for yourself. Now, a lot of the reasons they're not being sold, all these the whole diversity, because there's some regulation about getting them approved. Now in Madagascar, we had to face the same problem. We were actually the first to get certification to sell um, cricket powder or any edible insect in Madagascar, even though the locals eat it, um, mm -hmm. we actually had to get certification. And that meant also training and teaching and working with the, the Minister of Health uh, and Food Safety. And it was a learning experience. And um, 
we're happy that we do have certification now. We needed that along with some other um, certifications to actually be able to sell the product to international uh, uh, food agencies. Okay. There's a kind of interesting question from Allison who wondered whether you anticipate there being any corporate interest in Madagascar that might push back against this kind of work. And I don't, yeah, I'll just, to what extent you're comfortable answering that or speculating on it. It's um, just an interesting to think about the kind of tensions and play in the food space, especially when you're trying to do big scale solutions. Like it seem, it does seem like an interesting question. Well, that, that there's always uh, competition. And if we actually are competing um, with somebody there will be pushback always but right now I think there's a lot of realization that especially for certain markets in in health and wellness and nutrition and I would say international food relief um, those areas are ripe for change you know for all Madagascar almost all the products are imported mm -hmm. And because they're imported, it immediately becomes a band-aid. You're bringing through these contracts protein into Madagascar and they're kind of just dropped off in these villages in a sense with no long-term uh, sustainable change. So what if we could actually go into that village and nearby create an, a cricket farm where they're employed, where they learn how to do this at different scales from the, their homes to almost commercial village size mm -hmm. in which they have a permanent source of protein then. It's very different than dropping off a bag of rice or a bag of sorghum or a bag mm -hmm. of oil that they can keep. And then once it's gone, the problem is back. Mm -hmm. Do you know, this one is from Terry, and he says that his family and he have always wanted to visit Madagascar. Can you recommend any ways to do that that would actually be helpful to local people and various situations? Also, he'd like to know if you take volunteers at your research station. Oh, we do take volunteers. I'll say that first. Just go to madbio.org, madagascarbio.org, sorry, and you can find out how our, our volunteer uh, program works. Um, but to go to Madagascar, it's it's really important to go there and, and go to kind of locally owned ecotourism lodges, which are all over, and that really does help. Um, and it's going to be really needed. Um, tourism is going to be very down, and um, it'll be good to go back and reinvigorate um, this idea that people care about the forest. Mm -hmm. Sandra, I would like to know what your prediction is for how long it'll take American grocery stores to consistently start stocking insect products. Well, they probably already do, but we don't know it, right? I mean, insects are already part of all the grains. Right. That we buy. <laughs> but in terms of, uh, it's it's changing. Um, it's it's an industry that's an you know the investment is already like eight billion dollars in this field. You may not even be aware of this, but it's a booming. Uh, uh, enterprise across the world right now and it's being used for uh as a health alternative because you can get stronger because of protein you can actually alternative rather than actually eating uh vertebrates it's it's a, almost like almost being vegan kind mm -hmm. of, i wouldn't say that don't be mad at me but <laughs> to me it's a much nicer way to go as a cricket to go at the end of your life than than the prime of your life mm -hmm. and and I, I, I think it's changing. And as the products get integrated and, and accepted more, you'll start seeing products from uh, Entomo Farms, for example, or the bars that are produced by all these other companies all over, like Quick Start creates, has a great bar. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, Nathan had a quick follow-up. He'd like the scientific name of the bacon bug, please. He's having trouble Googling it. Oh, it's uh, interesting. Um, it's not even clear the species limits of it, but um, the genus is Zana, Z-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A. Denebriosa, Madagascarensis. Um, you can find the latest work on it by Le Monde uh, in 1959. <laughs> oh, that up. <laughs> wow, okay. Okay, we'll hit just a few more. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna take this one from, so Bernadette asks if there's, are there any significant differences between the crickets we feed our pets, for example, and the crickets that we can eat? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if you have pets like uh, you know, a lizard or something that you may be feeding at crickets, it's actually that industry which was the first to adapt to the growing awareness of edible insects. In fact, Entomo Farms was before a pet cricket farm company. In fact, oh. a long time ago, um, I had a large ant 
colony at the California Academy of Sciences. And we had a feed of crickets. And I called up uh, one of those farms and said, hey, I need 25,000 crickets a day. And they said, no problem. I'm like, <laughs> what? Who's, who's buying all these crickets? Well, those companies now often turn to making it for humans. Mm -hmm. And it's the same species I used for, uh, uh, for pets. And it's a common species found that they're, it's used throughout the world. And there's almost a recipe, there, a recipe I say that's becoming refined all the time with time, but it's very different than what we did for Madagascar. We could have brought this species into Madagascar and started farming it. We'd be more productive quicker probably. However, we wanted a native species. Yeah. Yeah. And so we did the research, tested many different species, found out which one would work best in the confines of a farm and are now learning the efficiencies. So we have some catch up to do. So research is always going to be part of the project. And, but it could be, you know, a company could come in with investment and actually use a, use that, you know, kind of commercial species and produce more than us quicker. So we're hoping that we can actually avoid that by continuing to grow in Madagascar. Okay. Do we need to, I just thought of, I just wondered this, do we need to give folks, do we need to clarify whether it is, like if there are people out there right now who are like, I'm going to go out in my backyard, I'm so inspired, find some crickets, fry them up, give it a try. Do we need to issue any like clarifications or warnings about some species being okay versus not okay? Well, um, if it's super colorful, <laughs> it's a warning sign. Like if it's red, there's some desert ones, you know, that are the Mormon cricket maybe that have really bright and, and, and red. That's an, that says I'm toxic. So avoid those. But if it's all one kind of brown or gray color, not a problem. However, if, you know, insects are, are crustacea. So if you're allergic to shrimp or other shellfish or other crustacea, go slow. Um, a subset of those people that are allergic to crustacea do have mild symptoms when they actually eat insects. So be, just be aware. Okay. And also if you do decide to do that, that's on you, not us. We're not telling you to go do this. Uh, okay. How about just a couple more? So this is, so Lionel asks, um, when you were talking about cricket farming, you showed a picture of a hanging grid. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how the whole process overall works? Um, so I should, if I could go back to that one slide, I'll just kind of briefly describe it anyway. So we have about two weeks or seven days you have an egg and that's just all in a clump that's incubating and then they hatch. And the second they hatch, you got to feed them. So you have to transfer them into a nice uh, home that has dark spots and, and uh, hiding places. And there they start to grow and they'll grow for like the next six weeks. Mm -hmm. And during that period, like between egg cartons um, and they'll grow there and you have to feed them. Now, we're still developing the best feed for it, but if you were in the States, you could feed them whatever you feed your cat or what feed your chickens, and you could feed the crickets. And then once they get to uh, maturity, they'll start, the males will start chirping. You know it's time to put out, what we use is little balls of cotton. And then the females lay the eggs on the cotton, which is what they do just before they die. Mm -hmm. So you, you try to gear it to harvest, after they've laid eggs, but as many eggs as possible, about one or two days before they would die normally. And then you would harvest all the adults, and that's what you eat. And ah. then you take those eggs and start the cycle over again. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, so you can all become cricket farmers now. <laughs> we, had, we had several people who wanted to know where you got your shirt, so you should probably just cover that. <laughs> Chirp Chips. It's a local company in the Mission okay. in San Francisco. Excellent. And then um, several people, including Iris, asked, and we'll just wrap up with this one, what's the best way for people to support this project? Well, you can support the Ca California Academy of Sciences. We have to build this building. If we don't build this building now, we won't be able to have our first farm. We won't be able to feed the needs we have already. We're only able to produce enough powder for 10% of our demand right now. And if we don't do it now, I am sure some other company is going to come in and bring in an, an invasive cricket and start farming that and, and create more havoc than benefit. And we need to be moving on this now. So we've created the need. People see it now. But we have to find the, the funding to make this happen. We also need volunteers to help us at all levels from, you know, 
you could enter this project from so many different interests. If you're interested in saving lemurs, if you're interested in child nutrition, if you're interested in improving livelihoods or, or modeling or inventing ways to actually have small villages do farming, there's so many exciting angles that you can actually uh, help with. Um, if you're an expert in nutrition, you can help with this. There, there's, it's, it's wide open, this area of research. And, and we do accept volunteers that have helped. In fact, one of our volunteers uh, that helped with the Bacon Bug Project and the Mishwal, she's now starting her PhD at Montclair University. Um, so we funnel great people into future uh, studies, but also we need people that will just help us think through these problems. Yeah. And what website should we direct people to again for that? Um, or to learn more? You can just Google Valala Farms and you'll find it or madagascarbio.org. Okay. And we'll drop those in the comments section on everything. All right. And thank you so much for that. It's that, I mean, I would really like to have you come back and talk about ants, but I'm so glad that we started with this project because it's just so cool. So thank you again. Thanks to everybody who watched and asked questions. I'll quickly mention to come back next Tuesday, we're going to be rejoined by Breakfast Club fan favorite, Natalie Nagalingam, our botanist, who's going to do a closer look at flowers, which will be a blast of beauty for your Tuesday afternoon. But um, Brian, I hope we can talk you back or talk you into coming back for some ant stuff or for follow-ups on this, whatever works. But thank you so much for being here. We so enjoyed it. I hope we all did. I had a great time. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. We'll see you next week. <laughs>